In this video, we're going to talk about the stratosphere, the second layer in the atmosphere, stretching from about 10 kilometers in altitude to about 50 kilometers in altitude. Now, if you didn't see the previous episode where we introduced the atmosphere and its layers, or if you just like a refresher, then click the link. You might recall from last time that the stratosphere differed from the troposphere because of its temperature profile, how the temperature changed with height. In the troposphere, temperatures decreased with altitude, whereas in the stratosphere, temperatures increased with altitude. And this property gives it some very unusual dynamics that we don't see here at the surface. To explore this, and to make things a little more rigorous, we use a concept called air parcels. First of all, let's isolate a little chunk of air in the atmosphere. And we can imagine doing this by using a transparent balloon with a few special properties. You envelop a section of air and tie it off, and the material that has made up the balloon doesn't allow heat to transfer from one side to the other. So the air inside the balloon is thermally isolated from its surroundings. And the balloon also doesn't weigh anything. So it's kind of an imaginary construct. And what we created then, that chunk of air, is referred to as an air parcel. And playing with this air parcel allows us to understand a little more deeply how the different layers in the atmosphere differ. Let's say that our air parcel is minding its own business and then all of a sudden it gets vertically displaced. This could be by flowing over a mountain and being pushed up, it could be pushed out of the way by an aircraft wing, or it could just be pushed by a careless PhD student. Now what happens next depends on where you are in the atmosphere. Now let's say we're in the troposphere and we take our air parcel and move it vertically upwards. Doing so, we've created a chunk of air which is warmer than its surroundings. And it's warmer than its surroundings because air gets cooler the higher you go in the troposphere and our air parcel is thermally isolated from its surroundings. So we've taken a lump of air that's slightly warmer and moved it into a place where the air is slightly cooler. However, the air parcel is at the same pressure as its surroundings. And the pressure at a level in the atmosphere comes from the weight of all of the air above that point in the atmosphere. Now, we can use the temperature and pressure of a gas to work out its density, which is its mass divided by its volume, or in other words, how much mass one cubic meter of that gas would have. And we can do this using what's called the ideal gas equation. We can rearrange this equation so that we work out the density, which we typically represent by the Greek letter rho. And we find that an air parcel, which is at the same pressure as its surroundings, but is warmer, has a higher temperature, we find that it is less dense. And so, like a bubble of air with low density, surrounded by water with high density, our parcel of air rises. And it keeps rising and keeps rising until something else gets in the way. This is called instability, and it governs a lot of how the troposphere works. In the troposphere, air is able to move vertically and transport heat and water vapour freely, like in clouds, for example. Now let's see what would happen if we repeat that experiment, but in the stratosphere instead of the troposphere. We take our air parcel, shift it vertically upwards, and watch as it sinks gently back down to its original position. Let's go back to the ideal gas equation. Because the temperature in the stratosphere increases with altitude, we see that our displaced air parcel, which is at the same pressure as its surroundings, is cooler than its surroundings and so has a higher density. This means then that it does the opposite of what happens in the stratosphere and sinks. This phenomenon is called static stability, and it's what makes the stratosphere so different from the troposphere. There's no large-scale vertical movement of air masses in the stratosphere. In fact, the name stratosphere comes from the fact that it is stratified, lots of different layers of air on top of one another that don't communicate with each other all that much. It's for this reason that commercial airliners typically fly in the lower stratosphere. They're literally flying above the storms of the troposphere, as well as getting a boost from the strong winds and the less dense air. Because of all of this, the stratosphere is regarded as generally being quite quiescent and, well, boring. And this may be true a lot of the time, but sometimes the stratosphere turns nasty, and some of the most violent events in the whole atmosphere take place in it. And we're going to talk about them in a future video. So you'll have to stick around to find out what I mean. With any kind of science, there has to be the question of application. How does understanding this stuff impact and improve our daily lives? And the answer to this question is kind of still being written. For the longest time, people just thought that the stratosphere was this quiescent layer above our part of the atmosphere that we influenced, but it didn't influence us. But some recent work, notably some by uh, my supervisor, 
has shown that this isn't really the case. The stratosphere isn't just a lid to the troposphere, it impacts surface weather in quite a big way. And so by improving our understanding of the stratosphere, we can hopefully improve our surface weather forecasts, which pretty much everyone on Earth agrees is a good thing to do. And it's particularly exciting because the stratosphere is a relatively predictable part of the Earth's atmosphere. With a few notable exceptions, we can predict relatively far into the future what the stratosphere will be doing. And so, if we can take generated stratospheric data and apply it to surface weather forecasts, we can predict further into the future and more accurately than we currently can with an improved understanding of the stratosphere. But that's the theory, at least. Part of my PhD is actually trying to work out how we're supposed to do this. And I'm quite a way off an answer just yet. Before we go this time, I want to introduce you to one new piece of physics. And it's something that we're going to be referring back to time and time again in this video series, starting with the next video. And that piece of physics is the first law of thermodynamics. It sounds very scary, but it's actually very simple. And it has to do with energy. Energy can be defined as the ability to do work. And it comes in many different forms. An object which is moving very fast has a lot of kinetic energy, which enables it to do a lot of work, for example, against gravity. If you shoot something vertically upwards with a lot of kinetic energy, in other words, shoot it very quickly, then it will go very high. Whereas if you shoot something vertically with not quite so much velocity, meaning it has not quite so much kinetic energy, it won't reach so high. That object wasn't able to do as much work against gravity. Or equivalently, the object had less kinetic energy to convert into gravitational potential energy. The higher an object is, the more gravitational potential energy it has. And so to get higher, you must have more energy to convert into gravitational potential energy. This is the fundamental idea of the first law of thermodynamics. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transferred from one form into another. What thermodynamics specifically talks about is heat, which is thermal energy, moving from one object to another. A hot object has a lot of thermal energy, while a cooler object has less. And if the amount of thermal energy in an object is increasing, then its temperature must also increase. And this happens when the amount of energy flowing into an object is greater than the amount of energy flowing out of it. Now that energy imbalance can't just go missing, it has to be converted into another form of energy. And in this case, that form of energy is thermal energy. Equally, if the amount of energy flowing out of an object is greater than the amount of energy flowing into it, then its temperature must decrease. The energy imbalance in the flow in and out has to be converted into a change in another form of energy. And that change of form of energy is a decrease in thermal energy. Remember this concept for next time, as we'll be making extensive use of it. So in this video, we've covered how the troposphere is dynamically unstable, while the stratosphere is statically stable. We've compared and contrasted how different the dynamics are in the stratosphere and the troposphere. We've answered the question of why we're interested in studying the stratosphere to improve our surface weather forecasts. And also introduced the first law of thermodynamics, that energy can't be created or destroyed, only transferred from one form into another. In the next video, we're going to delve deeper into the stratosphere and try and answer the question of why it has that peculiar property of being hotter the higher you go. We're also going to introduce some new concepts in atmospheric physics and answer the question of why ozone and the ozone layer is so important to all of this. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please do give it a like and consider subscribing to this channel for more educational content. By re-emitting slightly less radiation than it absorbs, a layer in the atmosphere warms slightly due to the first law of thermodynamics. And basically, reading them in detail and writing them up in a scientific language called LaTeX. It's a scientific typesetting language which makes everything look really gorgeous.